Our reading today comes from Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it, and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there, thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blasphemizing. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are, you not, why are you thinking these? Which is easier to say to this paralyzed man? Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth and forgives sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, open our hearts, our minds, our spirits, all of us, so that we understand the scripture, we live the scripture, and we demonstrate that same scripture to others. Let your gospel be alive in us today. Through the Holy Spirit we pray. I am going to cover and apologize first, though. So the scripture, I didn't realize there wasn't a Bible up here. So that's what I got off my phone there for Madeline. It's not that we were just posting that we're here right now or checking in with our friends, I promise. <laughs> Little things like that, going back into campus ministry after being in a parish church, have been interesting to me to watch that there are different ways of communicating. There are different means by which we understand and find Jesus Christ. There are different modes and technologies that we use, and yet it is the same gospel, it is the same Jesus Christ, it is the same Holy Spirit moving that has been moving for millennia in those students, in their lives, and certainly within the community that surrounds us at Elmont College. I uh, want to say again, thank you, thank you, thank you on behalf of Elmont for your congregation, but also your mission support through the Detroit Presbyterian say this without any type of hyperbole. I am in ministry because of congregations like you. I went to Elma College, and I am very proud of that fact as an undergrad. My wife went to Elma. We met at Elma. Our children have no choice. They will go to Elma. <laughs> but I also discovered my sense of call and vocation at Elma College. And whether you realize it or not, your per capita gifts that you offer every year, they directly support your undergraduate institution in the state of Michigan. These are your students. And while that connection has been strengthened and has diminished at different times in the relationships of the college to the presbyteries over the years, I am delighted to say we are reinvesting in that opportunity to be partners. So I go around everywhere and talk about these incredible students, the calls that they have to follow their vocation and what they will do next talk to Madeline afterwards. I'm interesting, but she's way more interesting. And she is the future of everything. No pressure. She is one of many, many students who are participating in the chapel program. And you have a lot of high school students here who will go off to work, to service, to the military, and to college settings. Wherever they go, whether it's Elma or somewhere else, continue to pray for them and ask them about their sense of call. There is something very holy and healthy about hearing the faith of our young people and what role that plays in our lives. I grew up in Brighton in the Detroit Presbytery, but I've also served in Lake Michigan, in the Mackinac Presbytery, and now in Lake Huron. I am a Michigander through and through. I'm proud to be back in the state that I love so very, very much representing this college. But I stayed in the state because of First Presbyterian Church of Brighton when I was 18. I wanted to go somewhere outside of Brighton and see the rest of the world. Livingston County was just too small for me, is what I was telling every person in a very unique way that no high school kid has ever said before. My parents sort of rolled their eyes at me and said, you'll find yourself wherever you go. And it was my senior pastor in Brighton who said, have you considered going and studying religion? 
Have you thought about going to college and actually doing the things you like to do here in Bible study, but doing it in an academic setting? That was the first time I'd really even thought about it. And to this day, I'm always embarrassed that I don't bring it up more with high school students. There is a very real opportunity for them to continue to grow their faith, regardless of what they're called to do. They can still explore together with their sisters and brothers, and especially in some of our college atmospheres that really foster that sense of finding your vocation like Elma, you can do this in a way that makes you better at all the other things God is calling you to do. It was as an undergrad that I was mentored and that I was encouraged and I was given the chance to fail and to succeed and through that sense of liberal arts residential experience, I learned about me and I also learned about what God was doing through me and through my sisters and brothers. I give thanks to the church for caring enough about things like that. There are plenty of other institutions out there, but the idea of supporting a school that still has a chaplain, that wants to embrace these students in the midst of their education, a wellness that extends well beyond their financial, their academic, and their sense of are they doing well in classes, but really are you healthy right now spiritually is a joy, and I love to get to do it. For me, in the midst of my education, in especially that residential setting, while I did grow in class, I found the most informative things for me were those moments with my peers talking about everything. It was the fellow students, the sojourners in my spiritual, educational, vocational journey who would talk with me in the middle of the night over pizza, who'd wander across campus, who would make bad decisions with me and tell me it's going to be okay afterwards. It was other young people now who are off in the world doing what they were called to do. In those moments in college, that's when I really discovered who I was and what God was doing. I have a large group of people I can point to in each interaction, each late night conversation at my fraternity house, each hangout session that went well into the night when we should have been studying or sleeping, but instead was some laugh fest of sitting in a dorm room just getting nothing done but learning about yourself in the midst of this conversation with other people. Those relational moments, those made me a minister. And those helped me understand Jesus Christ in the world. The chapel community at Alma College still strives to maintain that sense of relational community. And we're trying to create avenues for our students to know their faith together. One of my classmates at Alma College, the Reverend Dr. Melissa DeRosia, just accepted a call to be the senior pastor at Westminster Presbyterian in Ann Arbor, just down the street from you all a little bit here in the Detroit Presbytery. Now, we were friends in college. She was a year above me, and the idea that she's come back to the same state where I have and we're near each other again just gives me all kinds of like butterflies and great prayers of thanksgiving. And I told her that very carefully when I saw her the first time she was back. I said, I'm, I'm so glad you're here. She's like, yeah, I'm, me too. I'm like, no, no, no. I'm really glad you're here. And then it all came spilling out of me. 20 years I've known this woman, and I never really told her the impact she made on my life as a student. We'd kept in touch since we'd gone to seminary and graduated, but I started telling her about how I looked up to her when she was on campus. You see, she was a year older, so she was cooler and more mature and understood better music that I didn't know. And she used all sorts of different things that I didn't know about. She, she understood culture, and she would reference things in conversations that I wanted to be able to talk about. And she was fun, and she was energetic, and she was faithful. In the midst of all of the other college things, she was still faithful to Jesus Christ. She had all kinds of questions and all kinds of doubts, but she shared them very openly in our campus community. And my goodness, those were the moments I remember of seeing someone I admired, someone I looked up to, who could admit where she was doubting and also be very firm in her faith. And I shared that with her. Now she's back. I said, I, I don't know if you realize this, Melissa, but I, I really appreciated you as a 19-year-old being willing to share your faith, it made an impact on me. To which she actually looked at me, are, are you sure it was me and not someone else? <laughs> and then she says, I, I don't remember doing those things. 
And she tried to shift it around. It was sincere. She's like, I, I remember you doing some of those things. Like, oh, no, 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 it definitely wasn't me. You were the one I was looking up to. And she's like, well, I was kind of looking at you. And at the end of the conversation, we realized it was Mark. Mark was the guy we were looking up to. He works in insurance now in Colorado. <laughs> I'm sure we're just confusing him with both of us. But the idea that we were going back and thinking of all those moments that we had and the people around us whose faithful practice and following of Jesus Christ helped us to be where we are. No matter what we experience in our personal relationship with Christ, I'm convinced the community makes a difference. The passage in Mark today emphasizes our connections with one another, and it's one of my absolute favorite stories in the New Testament because of that emphasis that's placed on the community. Not the personal confession of faith, not one person all of a sudden being struck by the light and understanding. No, it's the others who have faith, and then this guy is healed. I know we acted it out so nicely here, and you have very active and willing students to get up and be silly a little bit there. I mean that sincerely. We should not take ourselves too seriously in the pulpit, in the sanctuary, wherever we are. We can laugh and we can cry simultaneously, and make sure you remind those students they are allowed to do both. But these passage shows us here a paralyzed man and his friends who out of love and compassion want to help him. They seem concerned for him. We know that they've heard about Jesus' healings and they want to bring their friend to this man that they believe will make their friend whole. And so they go ahead and drag him, but what we don't see or don't hear are any responses from the paralyzed man. We don't hear him saying, oh my gosh, yes, I desperately want to go see Jesus. We don't hear him saying, please don't bring me, I don't want to go. We don't see him helping them or doing anything. He is a passive participant in the midst of their faith. Now when they get him to the house where Jesus is preaching and speaking and healing, there's a throng of people and they can't get close. And I can almost feel myself, when I see a big line even in the cafeteria, I back off. I'm like, eh, I don't really need lunch today. Because I'm not good about that sense of, of being inconvenienced. And these guys don't seem to be phased by it. We can't get in the front door, doesn't matter. Let's go up on the roof. Let's dig a hole, because it's kind of a mud thatch thing. We'll just rip the hole off the roof, and we will put our buddy down in front. And again, the paralyzed man is silent. We don't hear him saying, uh, listen, I, I appreciate the help, but you really don't have to do this. Or we don't hear him saying, yes, I desperately want to get there. Make it possible for me to get in front of Jesus. He's silent. They get the man in front of Jesus after they've gone, done all of this malicious destruction of property. And Jesus looks at them and then looks at the man and says, because of their faith, you are healed. It isn't anything that the paralyzed man does. It's what his friends do. They believe. They work hard enough. They demonstrate their faith. And because they believe, the other experiences salvation. Milford Presbyterian, your faith, your love, your experience with Jesus Christ has helped other people, and will continue to do so. People who know that you've made an impact on them, and people who you do not know. Your faith has made a difference here in Milford, New Hudson, Detroit Presbytery, and all throughout the world. Your faith and your practice of faith has made a difference to Elma College students that you have never met before. You showing up on Sunday morning and praising Jesus Christ makes a difference to others. Through your faithful practice, others have found hope. I call on you to continue to do that intentionally, to bring healing to other people who might not believe it's possible, who don't know it's even happening, who are unsure or who are silent, but for you to believe strong enough that you can't help but rip the roof off of a place so that someone else will believe and do I can't help but laugh a little bit when I came downstairs. It's not the roof that's been ripped off, but you sure have ripped off a lot of other parts of the building downstairs. What you do with these giant gaping holes that you have now in your building, I hope will be carrying paralyzed people, metaphorically, of course, or physically, so they can understand they are part of something bigger than themselves. 
I hope you will use the new facilities that have been ripped up and dedicated so that someone else will believe because of your faith. I hope you will act as a community, as people who care about the other so much that you can't help but drag people to worship, bring them in and say, there is something special about this Jesus Christ, and I want you to believe because it's changed me. We talk about our personal relationship with Jesus Christ so much, and while I understand that need to have our connection with God, this really is a unique American concept over the last 50 years. Prior to this, the community is where we talked about the sense of relationship with Christ. And I am afraid that if we emphasize the personal, we have lost the communal. Congregations like yours have existed for decades because of the communal relationship you have with one another through Jesus Christ. Let us never forget that. Continue to use this space in such a way that you are demonstrating your faith so that others will believe. It is much easier to go into the unknown, to pray for a miracle, to go ahead and expect the impossible when you are all walking together towards that impossibility. Milford, do it together. Embrace the faith of your sisters and brothers. Be made better because their faith and I would challenge you as well. I, I regret waiting 20 years to tell Melissa it took that long for her faith to make an impact in mine. Tell one another. When you see someone leading in the choir, thank them. Because of your singing, I felt something today. When you see the Sunday school teachers who walk out of sanctuary to go ahead and take care of the young people, remind them, thank you. Your faith in teaching our young people, that inspires me and that helps me have hope for the next generation. Whatever it might be, be thankful that others believe so that we might experience the holiness of God. We do so with thanksgiving that we have the opportunity to do it. It is a pleasure to be with you, and I do hope you will share some of those stories with me of how your congregation has believed and how they continue to inspire in this world. Pleasure to worship with you today, and I hope you know you are worshiping with so many others, not just in our presbytery, but sisters and brothers in faith in all parts of the world who are proclaiming the same Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Therefore, let us trust that we are united together in our faith. Let us inspire one another for the way that we understand the love of God. Let us forgive one another just as we are forgiven by God the Son, and let us be united together just as we are united in communion with God the Holy Spirit both now and forevermore. 
Go now in peace. Amen.